Welcome to the panel addressing human rights challenges through the Universal Periodic Review on Bangladesh, co-hosted by the Committee to Protect Journalists, the International Federation for Human Rights, and Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. My name is Belena Guinaga, and I am uh, joined by four experts in the human rights situation in Bangladesh, Mohammad Asraf Busaman, Tonali Dawan, Andrea Georgetta, and Tasnim Khali, who will share their thoughts regarding the continuing violations faced by human rights defenders, journalists, and critical voices within the country, as well as the key findings and recommendations that the organizations established in the alternative reports submitted to the Human Rights Council leading up to the upcoming Universal Periodic Review that is taking place in November. I want to start by thanking all of you and the panelists for being here today. After all the panelists conclude their presentations, we will have a Q&A session. So please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box. Our first speaker this morning is Mohammad Asrafu Saman, who is an exiled Bangladeshi human rights defender based in Hong Kong. He has an extensive experience working with the United Nations human rights mechanisms, advocating for human rights in Bangladesh and other countries of Asia. Welcome, Salman. Thank you very much. Thanks to uh, CPJ, uh, FIDH, and RFK Human Rights for hosting this uh, very important discussion today. Uh, this exercise of universal periodic review that we have been part of for the last, uh, this is the fourth cycle. And uh, most of us have been part of this process on Bangladesh uh, since the uh, UPR process began. And uh, if we look back from 2009, February, when the first cycle of uh, UPR session uh, took place and at uh, just before a uh, month before exactly uh, one month away from the fourth cycle of the UPR uh, review on Bangladesh. If we ask the question to the people of Bangladesh, to the victims of Bangladesh and the human rights defenders of Bangladesh or the professionals of the country that has the human rights situation in that country improved. Provided that in the last three cycles, the government of Bangladesh has accepted many recommendations made by the member states of, in the Human Rights Council during the UPR process. And then they have also rejected uh, many of them, uh, including uh, uh, enforced disappearances, for example, regarding that, I'm not going into the details, but the, the issue is the situation of the human rights overall uh, have been extremely deteriorated as we speak uh, today. And that if we look at the perspective of press freedom, the situation has been much worse than before. If we look at the uh, 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 pr uh, protection from torture, for example, in the country, uh, situation has been so worse that even very, uh, I mean, from ordinary people to high profile political leaders, everyone face quite systemic uh, institutionalized form of torture uh, under the custody of the law enforcement agencies. And the very latest case that has been in today's newspaper is that a former parliament member of the main opposition party, uh, Shahiduddin Chaudhuri Ani, he yesterday cried in the, in the open court while describing the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, treatment that he got and with the brutal form of torture. And so the uh, report that um, uh, a dozen of human rights organizations, uh, including a, a large group of international organizations submitted uh, in the first week of April to the UN Human Rights Procedure for the uh, UPR review. And uh, now 
in seven months time the upr is going to take place and as we speak this time is uh, just few months away from the upcoming election in the country and we need to look that how the situation is evolving and then we also need to uh, 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 expect that the international community at this crucial time uh, of Bangladesh, they play their quite proactive role in uh, bringing the uh, uh, very pressing issues uh, during the UPR process and raise the right question, make the appropriate recommendations, and the country is held accountable. All, despite the fact that the UPR process has its own uh, challenges uh, in terms of the binding obligation of implementing it and the, the kind of accountability of the state who often abuse the system in a way by uh, just uh, making untrue statements, untrue uh, submissions of, uh, on behalf of the state and then get a, away of the process. So keeping all that realistic challenges in mind, well, we need to see the, uh, the, the situation of, of the country. So instead of going to all the details of the report or each of the aspect, what I would like to uh, uh, highlight is the problem with the institutions in the country. The, and the institutions, there are few things that comes, uh, should come to our mind. First, the institution that are capable of holding the government or the perpetrators accountable. So a government can be accountable in two ways, uh, particularly the, including the top level of executive of uh, uh, high profile officials is one is the parliament uh, where ideally there should be the opposition to hold the uh, ruling party accountable through the legislative body. Uh, proceedings. And the second thing is for every other action that is unlawful should be held accountable before the criminal justice system or the overall justice mechanism of the country. When we look at uh, Bangladesh as a whole uh, and its parliament, the elections were rigged uh, successive in, in the previous elections. In 2014, it was rigged. 154 got uh, elected uh, unopposed and then the uh, uh, and while the government needs only 151 to form a government so more than the majority they, that was i mean already obtained through uh, 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 uncontested by the opposition while everyone boycotted the second election that in 2018 december it was rigged on the previous night. The ballot stuffing happened uh, in 2018, uh, December 29, and this was reported by BBC. They recorded it on camera that stuffed ballot uh, were being carried from one floor to another of the polling station. And those video, short video footage and the photos are still available online. Anyone can uh, having the willingness to verify it's it's possible and the report that we are talking about we uh, the, the 12 organizations have submitted i believe that the uh, it has also been referenced with the uh, 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 appropriate uh, links to the report so that gives us the picture the kind of legislative body the country has the people are disfranchised and there is no true representation of the people in the parliament. Now, when we look at the judicial institution, then we see a judiciary in uh, last 15 years, while well, this government has been in office, we don't see the victims are getting the appropriate uh, universal access to justice. So the access involving uh, the largest scale uh, arbitrary arrest and detention of the dissidents, opposition leaders, 
uh, and uh, whoever who criticizes the government either uh, in public meetings uh, in person or in social media platforms. And uh, I mean, right now in this panel, we have victim who have been facing uh, cases for criticizing the government or exposing truth uh, about corruption and many other irregularities that uh, the uh, people experience in the country in their everyday life. So, uh, and then we cannot see an example of these politically motivated victims of uh, trumped up charges, uh, be it in the Digital Security Act, which has been now renamed as Cyber Security Act, or any other legislations. So, in, in the given context, the uh, anyone who has been targeted by the state, they simply don't have the guarantee to get justice. And if we go to the uh, uh, even other severe cases like enforced disappearances or extrajudicial killings in last 15 years, only one case involving the ruling party, two groups of ruling party, they uh, instigated the killing of another uh, and seven people got disappeared and murdered uh, by the rapid action battalion. This is the only case, the extrajudicial killings case or enforced disappearances case that has seen some sort of prosecution, although in the higher court, the perpetrators are getting uh, uh, released and acquittal. And if you look at the enforced disappearances cases, uh, not a single case not a single family or victim who has approached to the judiciary of the country has got any assertive or protective uh, ruling or any form of justice from the institution. So now when we look at an election coming in and the uh, institutions of the state, particularly the police, the Ministry of Law and Justice, they are working together to co collaborate with the prosecutors and the judges. And this has been acknowledged by the police officers themselves that they held meeting in the country to, proceed, uh, to expedite the prosecution against the potential candidates of the opposition parties. And that is happening now. Dozens of people are getting, I mean, uh, punished, convicted in trumped up cases. Uh, the latest one happened just this week. Uh, from the main opposition party. We have seen our colleagues, Adil Rahman Khan, uh, Nasiruddin Elan, the most credible two human rights activists, I mean, uh, 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 among the very few, uh, has been convicted in Trump Trump case. And then they are still in prison as we are speaking today. The uh, judicial process has been such, the High Court has granted bail, but the Office of the Attorney General uh, and the intelligence agencies have been acting behind the scene to stop the, uh, the process or delay the process so that the bail order doesn't reach to the prison and they don't get released in, uh, 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 the, in a faster pace, I mean, as, as they write. So I would stop here. If anyone has uh, uh, questions about that, I think myself and all of my colleagues will be happy to answer to that. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Saman. Now I want you to introduce you to Sonali Dawa. Sonali is a, an Asia researcher at the Committee to Protect Journalists, where she documents attacks on press freedom in South Asia and coordinates emergency assistance for journalists at, at risk. She previously served as a program officer with the American Bar Association Center for Human Rights and worked with Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International USA. Welcome, Sonali. Hello, and thank you so much to RFK Human Rights for moderating and FIDH for co-hosting with us, along with our panelists. We at the Committee to Protect Journalists have documented a worsening state of press freedom in Bangladesh since the previous Universal Periodic Review in 2018 in which the country had supported numerous recommendations related to press freedom and freedom of expression, including the protection of human rights defenders and journalists, the review of the then proposed Digital Security Act, 
and full and impartial investigations into all cases of violence against journalists. Instead, we have observed that Bangladeshi authorities are increasingly attempting to silence the media through arbitrary detention, legal harassment, and censorship. It is also implementing a series of measures impeding the media's ability to report freely on the upcoming election. This includes the Election Commission's announcement in April that it will not allow journalists covering the polls to use motorcycles, access voting stations without prior permission, or broadcast on social media directly from the stations. In practice, these policies restrict the media's ability to move and report freely, and the public's right to information is compromised. Meanwhile, the New York Times also reported that Bangladeshi authorities are increasingly limiting access to foreign journalists. Actually, in preparation for an expectation of surging violence against journalists in the coming months, CPJ earlier this week released a journalist safety guide for reporters covering the election with information on digital and physical safety and advice on protecting oneself in cases of arrest, detention, and abductions as well as information on reporting from reporting on election rallies, protests, and polling stations. Bangladeshi authorities are also increasingly stifling the independent domestic media ahead of the election. In March, authorities arrested Shamsuz Manshams, a correspondent for the leading daily national newspaper Protham Olo, following his article on price hikes in the country. Shams was arrested under the Digital Security Act, a draconian law that criminalizes several forms of free expression online, and my colleague Thasneen will speak more about that shortly. Twelve days following Shams's arrest and a parliamentary speech, Prime Minister Hasina had labeled Pothum Olo, which has been critical of her government, as a quote-unquote enemy of the Awami League democracy and the country's people. Shams was later released on bail, but he and Pothum Olo editor Matthew Rehman regularly appear in court for proceedings under the Digital Security Act. This harassment is widely seen as an attempt to undermine the reputation of Protham Olo in the lead up to the upcoming election. Similarly, Protham Olo special correspondent Rosina Islam, who was detained for seven days in 2021 in apparent retaliation for her reporting on government corruption, faces an ongoing investigation under the Colonial Era Official Secrets Act, which can carry a death sentence upon conviction. Her passport remains in judicial custody, which impedes her ability to report and move freely. Now, the Digital Security Act has been widely used against Bangladeshi journalists, accompanied by allegations of torture and disappearance. According to the Center for Governance Studies, over 400 DSA cases were filed against journalists since its enactment in 2018. Writer Mushtaq Ahmed died in jail after over nine months of pre-trial detention under the law and alleged torture in state custody. There has been no impartial or transparent investigation into the circumstances surrounding his death. Justice also remains elusive for his co-accused, Kapir Kishore, who was also allegedly tortured and jailed during the same period. He has since fled to Sweden following his release on bail. Following widespread international pressure and ahead of the upcoming election, the government announced the replacement of the DSA with the Cybersecurity Act, which I'm sure Tasneem will speak more about. What I would like to emphasize here is that the DSA cases will not be withdrawn despite the new law. And this is very reminiscent of what happened uh, prior to the previous election in 2018 when we saw that the Digital Security Act had repealed Section 57 of the Information and Communication Technology Act, which had criminalized publishing, quote unquote, fake, obscene, or defaming information in electronic form. So while Section 57 was repealed, photojournalist Shahid al Alam, who was arrested and allegedly tortured in 2018, continues to face judicial harassment five years later under a now repealed law. Among the journalists that will continue to face persecution under the DSA is Adora Yasmin, a Bangladeshi woman journalist whose case was raised with Prime Minister Hasina in August in a joint letter by CPJ and 18 human rights organizations, including RFK Human Rights and FIDH. Yasmin faces an ongoing investigation following a complaint in May by a leader of the local religious syndicate, Rajar Darbar Sharif, whose alleged crime she covered in an expose for RTV. What's even more disturbing is that since mid-July, she has reportedly been 
subjected to unlawful physical surveillance by members of the Dajjal Baghdad al-Sharif, who have continually followed her and threatened to file additional complaints against her and her family members for her reporting. This harassment continues unabated and threatens her ability to live and work freely. Now, impunity persists in this case, as well as killings, abductions, and physical violence against journalists. Just last month, Musharraf Shah, a student journalist at the University of Chittagong, was reportedly beaten by around 15 to 20 men with the Chatla League, the student wing of the Awami League, after he reported on a factional clash. As of today, no suspects have been held accountable, and he fears returning to campus and that he may be targeted again. Also last month, authorities deferred their probe report in the 2020, uh, 2012 double murder of journalist couple Sagar Sarawad and Mahmoud Rooney for the 101st time. A 2022 statement by UN human rights experts found that it is quote unquote, widely believed that the couple were targeted because of their investigative reporting on corruption in Bangladesh's energy sector, which they were about to publish. But I would also like to note that acts of physical violence that are intended to chill the press are not limited to journalists alone. In March, unidentified men severely beat Mohinur Khan, the brother of UK-based exile journalist Zulkar Nain Saeed Khan, with iron rods. This followed the latter's reporting on alleged high-level government corruption and the country's expanding surveillance apparatus. Similarly, as of today, no suspects have been held accountable in this disturbing act of transnational oppression, which is surging at an alarming rate in Bangladesh and requires an urgent response from the international community through mechanisms, including the UPR. My co-panelist, Thasni, may also be willing to speak about his experience regarding the harassment of his family in Bangladesh. Now, I'd like to conclude my remarks by emphasizing that a legitimate election depends on a free press and the unimpeded flow of information. During the previous election in 2018, Bangladesh throttled the internet. Journalists were arrested and investigated for reporting on alleged ballot irregularities and denied access to polling stations. If the Bangladesh government is truly interested in demonstrating the validity of the upcoming polls to the international community, as well as domestically, it must ensure that journalists may report without fear of reprisal and all forms of abuse and attacks against the media swiftly see accountability. Thank you, and I welcome any questions during the Q&A. Thanks to you, Sonali. Uh, next, let's welcome Andrea Giorgetta, who is the Asia Desk Director for the um, FIDH, the International Federation for Human Rights. He is based in Bangkok, Thailand. Andrea has been working on human rights and democracy in Asia for the past 20 years. He has authored numerous reports, opinion pieces, and analysis on a wide range of human rights issues. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Belen. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Um, I'll just make some brief remarks about enforced disappearances in Bangladesh, the topic that I was assigned. Um, particularly in connection with the UPR of Bangladesh um, that is coming up next month. Um, so there is perhaps more time for the discussion and Q&A. Um, first of all, let's establish a couple of key basic facts. Um, and fact number one is that enforced disappearances do take place in Bangladesh. Um, this is a fact that is disputed perhaps only by the government of Bangladesh. National and international human rights organizations have documented the occurrence of this crime for many years. Um, the UN Working Group on Enforce uh, and Involu or Involuntary Disappearances, or WGEID, recorded 70 cases of unresolved disappearances in Bangladesh as of May this year, uh, with 10 additional cases that have been clarified by the government. Um, this figure of 70 cases is conservative and should be taken with a grain of salt for various reasons, and I can explain more in the Q&A, perhaps. Um, prominent human rights NGO, Dikar, whose leaders, as many of you, and probably all of you know, are, are now in jail, um, and which is a member organization of my own organization, FIDH, recorded 521 cases of enforced disappearances over the past decade. 
And um, my organization, FIDH, in April 2019, published a report on enforced disappearances. This report, which you can find on the FIDH website on the Bangladesh page, was titled Vanish Without a Trace. And it documented numerous cases of enforced disappearances as well, and argued that in, in the context of Bangladesh, enforced disappearances, in fact, amount to a crime against humanity which could and should be the object of an investigation conducted by the International Criminal Court, the ICC. We came to this conclusion based on an analysis of the patterns, trends, and um, the modus operandi of law enforcement agents in the commission of enforced disappearances. And uh, what we found is that in Bangladesh, the conduct met the three key requirements for it to amount to a crime against humanity under the Rome Statute of the ICC, to which Bangladesh, in fact, just is a state party. Um, now, I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not here to give you a lecture on international law, but very briefly, the three key requirements are one, that enforced disappearances are widespread and systematic. Two, that they are committed as part of an attack directed against the civilian population. And three, that they should follow a state sponsor policy. So in the case of Bangladesh, all these three requirements were met, at least according to our analysis. Um, and again, fact number two is that, that as uh, Zaman correctly said um, in, in, his, in his remarks, is that there is no effective remedy for victims of enforced disappearances in Bangladesh. And, and, and there is a clear lack of will by the authorities to investigate adequately enforced disappearances and prosecute the perpetrators of this crime. Um, and, and by the way, those two factors, so the, the, the lack of will and the lack of effective remedies, are also the two factors that, that, that support the need for an international investigation into enforced disappearances in Bangladesh by the ICC or any other ad hoc international body. So unfortunately, this problem will not go away anytime soon. This issue will not go away anytime soon. And, and I want to be very clear that, that having hopes that the UPR will change this dynamic in the short term is, is wishful thinking. Um, but the UPR could be a starting point to change a few things. And uh, what do I mean by that? If we go back and look at the previous UPR cycles of Bangladesh, we saw that in 2013, during the second UPR, the government received only four recommendations from five countries, and only one was accepted. The government, in fact, justified this non-acceptance of the recommendation, or most of them, by, by saying that, and, and again, I quote, issues such as forced disappearance or extrajudicial execution are not permitted under Bangladesh law. Fast forward to 2018 and the third UPR of Bangladesh, the government, in fact, received eight recommendations on enforced disappearances from a total of 14 countries. So the number of recommendations on this specific issue basically double from four to eight, and the number of recommending states almost triple from five to 14. And, and so this is reflected not only the fact that the issue had become increasingly serious on the ground, but also greater international awareness about the occurrence of this crime in Bangladesh. And um, at, at that UPR cycle, in fact, the government accepted four of the eight recommendations. And again, there was a justification behind this non acceptance of, of half of the recommendation. And the government said that the legal system, and again, I hear I quote, does not recognize any terms such as enforced disappearance. And the government went on to say, and I quote again, crimes like abductions and kidnappings are well defined in the criminal justice system of Bangladesh. So the government position, in fact, shifted from 2013, when it said that enforced disappearance did not exist, to 2018, when it said that there was no definition of enforced disappearance in Bangladesh. So basically saying that, that there was nothing they could do about it. They could only deal with other crimes, such as abductions, kidnappings, which have fairly different legal elements from, from that of enforced disappearance. And so what, what should the international community do at, at, at the UPR? Because that, that, in the end, is the key questions. And, and here, I, I'm particularly thinking about recommending states. I'm not sure any of the participants is a diplomat, but I think it's important to, to, to remind this. 
Um, so the states that will take the floor during the review of Bangladesh on 13 November um, and, and will make recommendations to the government of Bangladesh. So obviously we encourage as many recommending states as possible to raise the issue of enforced disappearances and to make recommendations about it. And many states should and could and should recommend that Bangladesh investigate enforced disappearance also that Bangladesh become a state party to the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances, also known as ICPPED or the said convention. And that's good, but they could also go beyond this and in fact, make a very specific recommendations to the recommendation to the government of Bangladesh. Um, I, I would argue in fact that the most important recommendation they could make would be to recommend Bangladesh in fact, criminalize enforced disappearances by amending the country's laws and in particular its criminal laws to introduce the crime of enforced disappearance. If Bangladesh were to criminalize enforced disappearances, it would eliminate the excuse that the government has made in particular in international fora that there is no legal provision to deal with, with this type of crime. So I hope at least my message for today is sufficiently clear. On 13 November, we want to see recommendations on enforced disappearances and particularly recommendations that, that uh, Bangladesh criminalize enforced disappearance. I think I will stop here, but um, I'd be happy to take any question you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um... Now, allow me to introduce to our last panelist, Tasnim Halil, a Swedish Bangladeshi journalist who is currently based in Malmo. He is the editor in chief of Netra News, uh, a Sweden based platform for public interest journalism covering Bangladesh. He is also the author of the book Jalad, Death Squads, and State Terror in South Asia. Welcome, Tasnim. Thank you very much, Belen. Uh, so I would like to start with my own story as Zaman and uh, Sonali have been referring to this. So um, I myself am um, a victim, so to say, a remote victim of the Digital Security Act because back in 2020, I guess, or 2019, I posted something on Facebook saying that the liberation war of Bangladesh was led by uh, this army league leader called Fazuddin Ahmed and others. And at that point in time, uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman uh, was in jail in Pakistan. I mean, this is absolutely non-controversial historical fact. And in my case paper, when I look at the charges against me, I see that a DAD or Deputy Assistant Director of Rapid Action Battalion saw that post on Facebook and thought that I am somehow insulting the father of the nation. And so I am slapped with uh, a Digital Security Act case. I mean, this is one of the allegations um, among many. I think in uh, CPJ's, uh, CPJ RFK's um, submission, uh, my case is briefly noted. Um, I said I am the remote victim of this harassment. Uh, the primary victim of this harassment is actually my mother, who lives in Silet in Bangladesh. And she has been receiving, uh, you know, all, always after the midnight visits by the police, by the special branch. One time the DGFI went to see her. That was during the daytime. And they have been using these trumped up charges against me to harass my mother and hold her hostage. So when I say that I'm a remote victim, the primary victim here is my mother, whose only crime here is that she is the mother of a journalist living abroad and who is critical towards the government. That's it. Uh, 
And this kind of hostage taking we have seen again and again when it comes to DSA and other repressive draconian laws in the country, right? So uh, in the USA, we have an exile journalist, Kanok Sarwar, uh, whose sister was actually very illegally arrested by the Rapid Action Battalion. Uh, we have in the UK, we have journalist uh, Leeton, whose brother in Noakali was arrested and, and later released. So this kind of hostage taking uh, we see again and again. Then we have the case of Khadiza Tul Kobra, uh, which is, I think, when we are discussing uh, these cases at the UPR, we should also remember that uh, this is also a violation, serious violation of the Child Rights Convention, right? Because she was a minor when um, uh, this alleged uh, offense happened. She, her crime was she was moderating a Facebook live talk show where one of the guests said something about the government, which uh, the government did not like. And right now that, that girl is in prison without bail. And the court system is actually refusing to give her bail. Uh, Zaman actually mentioned uh, that DSA has become CSA and Sonali also mentioned that. I think it shows that you know, like this whole international criticism about DSA have had some kind of effect on the government. At least try, they are trying to, you know, like, um, you know, spin it in a different way. They are trying to say we have changed laws and stuff. Uh, one of the challenges DSA is having directly on um, journalism in our case uh, we are a investigative newsroom and we do investigate uh, allegations, serious allegations of torture, extrajudicial executions and enforced disappearances in Bangladesh. And we have seen something very interesting and that is uh, they are also going after people who would talk to us. So one of the documentaries we released last year is called Secret Prisoners of Dhaka. Uh, we found a secret detention facility inside Dhaka Kintonment, the military barracks run by the military intelligence agency. Uh, interestingly, one of the survivors who on record spoke to us was sued under DSA in three different places, including, I mean, he was, one, he was the key accused and the Netro News was named as the secondary accused in three different places. And police has visited his home just as a form of harassment. Now, I'll now segue uh, a little bit into this question of enforced disappearances, which I agree with Andrea is a very serious human rights crisis in Bangladesh right now, which needs addressing. And obviously the member states who are going to put forward recommendations should uh, include this in the recommendation, the question of enforced disappearances. Hasinur Rahman is one of those people whose case was raised at the United Nations, the working group, and the working group sent his name to the Bangladesh government, and the government did not do anything. And when, when Hasinur Rahman was released, when he went public, when, when he spoke to us, if you if the government of Bangladesh was in any sense of the word serious about investigating these crimes, they would have at least gone and spoken to Hasinur Rahman about his own experience. I mean, he is talking to the press. I don't understand why exactly a survivor of enforced disappearances would not, enforced disappearance would not be interviewed by the law enforcement agencies who are supposed to, you know, like look into these crimes. Another very important point, uh, Andrea said that uh, uh, the, the government does not admit. The government actually, you know, in, in, in some cases, some government officials actually have admitted. For example, Gohor Rizvi, the international affairs advisor to the prime minister, 
in an interview with the DW, uh, Tim Sebastian, he actually said that crimes like enforced disappearances happen, but they don't happen as a matter of state policy. That is, the, he's on record with that. Okay. Another point that I want to uh, mention is that the Bangladeshi government is always insisting that there is no crime called enforced disappearance in their law book, which is very misleading to say because the penal code, the CRPC, actually defines what we understand as enforced disappearance. Something very close to that is unlawful confinement and restraint. So if you look at the penal code of the country, section 340 to 347 actually speaks to this crime and the police has absolute legal responsibility to you know, uh, investigate and these cases and bring to justice the perpetrators, which they have not done. So this is it's actually factually incorrect for the Bangladesh government to claim that you know, like there is nothing like enforced disappearance in our law book. Law book. There is. I mean, one of the section actually talks about what happens if, when a agent of the state, for example, a police officer or a, a, or a, or a paramilitary officer actually forces some, uh, someone, an individual in unlawful confinement. Um, I, I could go on, you know, like there are, there are some uh, legal aspects of it, which I think the international community should be absolutely sure about. Enforced disappearance is a crime in international law and it is a crime in Bangladeshi law. And the, the state parties should obviously, of course, remind Bangladesh government to, you know, be mindful of his responsibility of protecting uh, its citizens and residents against this crime against humanity. And um, I, I will be available uh, for any questions. Thank you, Tasneem, and thank you um, to all the panelists. At this point, we will open our uh, Q&A uh, section. So we have been receiving uh, some questions, but we uh, feel free to, to keep sending questions in the Q&A box, and we will uh, be happy to answer them within the, the hour. Um, the first question we have is for Saman. Uh, Saman, uh, could you please comment more on what specific recommendations uh, could be made during the Universal Periodic Review to ensure that there are transparent and free elections? Uh, thank you very much. The, uh, regarding free and fair election, the first thing that Bangladesh needs is an interim independent government which is completely a separate government from the Sheikh Hasina government. The Bangladesh people have experienced that for last 15 years and Sheikh Hasina government has already uh, proven that repeatedly that a credible, participatory, free, fair, inclusive election is absolutely impossible un under this uh, incumbent government. And uh, millions of people who have been newly registered as electorate, they have not got a chance in their lifetime uh, uh, to cast their right to vote. So in this, uh, and also, I mean, it's a, 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 the people need legitimate government, not uh, illegitimate government like what it has at the moment uh, they have. So for that context, the prerequisite for uh, credible election is an independent government, uh, absolutely separate from Sheikh Hasina's government. And in whichever format it may be possible, that should be implemented and the international community should act proactively to implement that. Thank you, Salman. Uh, the next question is for Sonali. Uh, I'll, I'll read the question. Uh, you call the attention on transnational re repression by the Bangladeshi authorities. Uh, can you please elaborate uh, a bit more on this? Right. So we have we at CPJ have actually documented 
in numerous cases of transnational repression over the past several years, Tasneem had actually mentioned the case of US-based journalist Konak Sarwar, whose sister was arrested in, I believe, late 2021. She was released on bail in early 2022. And what I would emphasize here is that she was actually arrested on the basis of a fraudulent Facebook account that she had herself reported to the police prior to her arrest. Now, a day after she was arrested, then the authorities had filed an additional complaint against her, claiming that they had recovered narcotics from her home. And this is a very common practice that we see across the board in Bangladesh. Um, there's a very common practice as well of the authorities there visiting the families of local journalists, uh, critical exile journalists, questioning them. We have seen the case of Abdurra Bhutto, a, a journalist in the UK as well, whose brother was arrested a few years back. And he has also reported that the authorities have repeatedly visited his home um, and also the home of his other brother and questioned them repeatedly. So essentially, these tactics are used, as Tasneem mentioned, to hold the family members of critical exiled journalists hostage. Now, a lot of the critical journalism we're seeing on Bangladesh is coming from the international media. If you look at the domestic media, they have been choked by laws such as the ICT Act, the Digital Security Act, the Official Secrets Act. Self-censorship is pervasive. So in many cases, sensitive stories are covered by those in exile, and the authorities are resorting to very drastic measures in violation of international law to essentially harass and intimidate these journalists in exile. Thank you, Sonali. Uh, our next question is addressed to Sonali and Tasneem. Um, it says, can you comment on the revision of the Draconian Digital Security Act, which has been used uh, in Bangladesh to massively criminalize those perceived to be critical, including journalists? Uh, will the revised Cybersecurity Act make the scenario any different? Uh, I'll go first. I think if you look at the criticism of the Digital Security Act that has been raised by Bangladeshi groups, Bangladeshi journalists, and international human rights community, uh, press freedom groups, including CPJ. Uh, if you look at that, uh, I think we would find a summary of the criticism uh, in, a, in a recommendation uh, by the United Nations Human Rights Agency. And I would say this None of those criticisms, none, were taken into account when they, uh, you know, just changed the name from Digital Security Act to uh, Cyber Security Act. It's just a renaming exercise, and maybe in one or two sections, uh, which are rarely used they have actually changed uh, uh, the, the provision for bail and stuff like that. But two of, the, two of the sections which are most criticized and which the two of the sections that have been used most prolifically to target journalists and opposition activists and students and whatnot I mean, those are virtually unchanged. So this is obviously a problem. It's just a renaming exercise. And I think one of my uh, dear friends, um, Rizal Rahman, I mean, he once mentioned this. I mean, he, he, he has been advocating for this for a while, that <clears throat> we actually need a law for the protection of people, right? It should not be a securitization of the digital space. And we should actually afford through law and through law enforcement, we should actually um, offer protection to the people. And that's exactly what we want. Uh, we don't see that in Bangladesh, though the government has been trying to market D DSA and now they're trying to market CSA 
as a sort of you know necessary legal instrument that they need in the digital age uh, we don't need uh, persecution in the name of security we actually need protection uh, from our own governments when it comes to our rights uh, freedom of expression and all other relevant rights online Sonali, would you like to answer? Sure, I'll just add in addition to what Tasneem said that uh, yes, of course, the Cybersecurity Act does appear to be old wine in a new bottle and the repressive sections of the DSA that had been used to create this culture of fear within the media and critics alike have been retained in the new law. And while there have been some cosmetic changes and <clears throat> for certain offenses, the jail term has been reduced. Ultimately, this has not changed the nature of the law. The use of criminal punishment to encroach on legitimate forms of free expression create a, as an environment of self-censorship in the media. And these same concerns have been uh, retained from the DSA to the CSA as well. And I'll also just note, for example, that um, in, the, in the new Cybersecurity Act, the jail term for defamation has been removed and the government has pointed to this as an instrument of progress. But what I would emphasize here is that this is nowhere close to the rectification of the DSA because the reason that the defamation law was abused um, previously is that a third party, any third party can file a defamation case under the law in the pretext of claiming the defamation of another individual. So as a first step, I would emphasize here, the defamation should be made a matter of civil litigation rather than criminal litigation. Thank you. Thank you, Sonali. Our next question uh, is addressed to all the panelists um, or to whoever wants to, to answer it. Can you comment about the these or misinformation that, continue, that is conti continuously spreading by the regime people uh, and that the people are the victim of that propaganda? I'll take it because we have uh, worked on a few investigations on uh, government sponsored propaganda. Uh, we have actually seen, and this is very uh, germane right now because another election is supposedly coming up. Um, before the last election in 2018, we saw that uh, Facebook uh, took steps to uh, delete and remove some of the uh, disinformation operations from its platform. And they specifically mentioned that most, if not all, of those were actually run by individuals connected to the government. Uh, and then our own investigation into DGFI's Signal Intelligence Bureau shows that Bangladesh government hires civilian contractors to not only engage in disinformation operations, but also hack into opposition activists, opposition political party accounts, and hijack those. So these are supposedly cyber crimes. <laughs> And under under the Digital Security Act, which the government in itself is engaging in. Uh, I think here, uh, I mean, obviously when your the state party in itself is engaged in criminal activities, uh, I really don't know where we should turn to, but definitely in these cases, platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, um, and, and all other, um, technology platforms do have a responsibility to protect their users from disinformation and misinformation and cyber attacks. And um, I think, I mean, their government should also have very clear positions on these things. Thank you, Tasneem. Um, there's another question from the audience uh, that this one is addressed to Andrea. Uh, what should the international community do to address the widespread and systematic use of enforced disappearance? You mentioned that this should fall under the ICC jurisdiction. 
what else could be done in your opinion? That's always the, the million dollar question. Uh, perhaps before going to that, I, I actually wanted to say something about misinformation and propaganda because in fact, what we've seen with Bangladesh and particularly in recent years and particularly because we engage in a lot of processes with um, UN mechanisms and European Union institutions is that in fact, the government has, has, has gone to great and I would say almost unprecedented lengths in terms of spreading its misinformation, even among UN uh, human rights mechanism, EU institutions, members of the diplomatic communities, in some case, open campaigns uh, through, through news outlets. And this is something that, that really, particularly with regard with UN institutions and EU institutions, um, even some officials of those very institutions have told me something that 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 we've not that we've never seen, but we rarely see or receive with with countries that 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 um, um, really don't follow diplomatic protocol. So really aggressive language and uh, and misrepresentation of facts and um, uh, and arguments is something that that we've seen. Um, increasingly over the past several years from the government of Bangladesh. In terms of enforced disappearances, look, again, um, I think I think there are many multilateral uh, fora uh, through which the international community, UN member states can engage. They can also engage directly with the government of Bangladesh. And, um, and I think, again, the recommendations that I made um, during during my remarks are 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 still valid. Um, there are there are many examples, for instance, in Asia from which from which Bangladesh could learn, and there are some states that perhaps should 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 uh, should be engaging with Bangladesh in terms of um, of their experience, for example, in terms of ratification of the International Convention for the Protection of Persons Against Enforced Disappearance. Uh, just this year, two countries from from Asia, um, the Maldives and uh, and the Republic of Korea, or South Korea, ratified that convention. So um, again, um, this is a convention that has been there for a long time, um, and, and 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 countries can accede to it. Um, I think I, I think there 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 can be ways in which countries can share good good. Experiences and positive experiences of what means for their legal system, from the judiciary for accountabilities. Then you have a whole lot of uh, of, of other avenues which are or international accountability mechanisms. This is not really up to states, but but for example, there is always a hope that of the pile of of complaints that sit uh, with the, the office of the prosecutor at the ICC, um, I can safely say there are at least a couple concerning enforced disappearances in Bangladesh. And again, I think in, in some cases, a matter of, again of, of resources from the office of the prosecutors or, or other or other reasons, but, um, but eventually, um, there, there, there should also be hope that, that, that that's an avenue that can be pursued. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Samuel, I don't know if you have any comments on that. I mean, regarding uh, enforced disappearances, Andrea has already said it. I mean, uh, what is needed is uh, uh, the ICC itself, the Office of the Prosecutor, uh, needs to have a commitment uh, uh, very well demonstrated that this uh, uh, entity is not going to overlook or not going to have a bargain uh, with the Bangladesh uh, government while they are dealing with the Rohingya uh, case being under investigation uh, by the ICC. So uh, in fear of having uh, their access to the Rohingya refugee camps blocked by the Bangladesh government and just to keep that uh, uh, access on, they should not make a compromise in terms of uh, uh, the crime uh, against humanity under Article 7 of the Rome Statute, uh, uh, which is enforced disappearances. And then uh, they should also uh, uh, be mindful that uh, 
people of this uh, who are the victims of this crime they deserve justice and there is no reason to deny justice to them so from that and then the international community need to also see that where bangladesh government blocks all resort for the people to go and seek redress in within the domestic uh, system of justice so uh, uh, the international justice is the only option for them and there is a very strong and committed role to play uh, in this case perfect sam and thank you so much i want to thank uh, again to all the panelists and to all of you for being part of this conversation today have a good rest of your day.